Hi, and welcome to episode five of the Wildwood podcast. Today, we're joined by Sally Holt, who is the head of carnivores and small mammals, and she's also the vice chair for the Biarza Species Advisory Committee. Thank you very much, Sally. Did I get that right? You did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, Sally is very excited to be filmed, and she definitely didn't try and get out of this like three or four times already. <laughs> <laughs> so um, don't worry, the questions will all be very relaxed. <laughs> um, how did you get into working in zoos? Um, I definitely had a different path in. I um, wasn't doing anything to do with zoology um, beforehand. So actually did a degree in English and went off to do journalism initially actually in London. Um, and then very quickly realised that this was not what I wanted to do. And always liked being practical, always had an interest in everything I was looking at outside, whether that's the habitats down to insects or bird life that's there. And really wanted to follow that passion. Um, so I got into the industry working my five day a week job up in the city and then volunteering locally um, at a zoo in Kent um, for about three to four months and I think that hard work paid off volunteering and showing up every day and a job came up here well going on 12 years ago now and took a chance to apply for it and was very very lucky I think and, and got that job and I've been here ever since. Amazing. And how did you transition into um, sort of specialising in what, carnivores and, and small mammals? How did that come about? Um, I think really sort of seeing some gaps when I, when I got here or some, some things that I could definitely get my teeth into. So um, primarily... First of all, um, that's a great pun for uh, carnivores. Just oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, at, the, at the time, there wasn't really much work going on with our European wildcats here. We were part of a breeding programme, but um, we could definitely have done a bit more to be involved with that. So... Mm. Um, sort of just just grabbed it, grabbed the opportunity and, and went with it and I think that really sort of paved the way into more carnivore work um, and opened up more channels that way um, so yeah I sort of got on board with the, with the captive breeding and um, that involved a lot of networking and um, throughout other collections in the UK that hold the species and particularly with um, the stubbock keeper for European wildcats um, and that just that, that led the way and it really started a passion for the species. And I know you're super passionate about you know all the animals that you look over, but I know that the wildcats are they've got a special place in your heart. What's happening with the with the projects that are going on at the moment? Um, so there's several wildcat projects, and we've been part of um, one for a very long time. So we work with saving wildcats in Scotland, and for well over a decade, Wildwood have contributed numerous kittens to the cats breeding program for that project, and we're still very much working with them and, and going by their direction on, on how we can help them. The most important thing with anything like this when you're reintroducing a species or any captive breeding program is that you're working collaboratively together with the other projects so you're learning from each other and not making the same mistakes when you could openly say what you did wrong and it's, I think it's really important that you're very transparent and you're very honest about these things because you're all trying to do the same aim. Yeah, exactly. And how has the um, sort of the captive breeding been going in the in the last couple of months here? How has, has there been any progress? Um, what's it kind yeah, of so like? the last couple of months we've had some really exciting moves. Um, we had our first set of cats come in, so we've got two pairs of cats. I um, should probably mention, unfortunately, these cats are actually off show. Um, we want to make sure that the cats are bred for release um, or even are contributing for the Scottish project or part of the captive breeding programme for the Scottish project um, aren't too habituated to people. So they are off show for numerous reasons, but that's mainly the main one. Mm -hmm. So they came in um, beginning of the year um, they were initially separated and then we mixed them together. So that involves sort of monitoring and another experience to make sure that goes successfully and hopefully it does look like we should be having kittens for spring. Um, so so cross fingers that it, it's successful and they, and they rear them um, successfully. So we'll see. And at what point will we sort of know that? Do you, do you go, it like, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Um, do you kind of give them a little bit of time originally um, to sort of, I mean, I guess you just sort of just as hands off as possible. What, what's, what's the process like in, in terms of actually finding out when they've got kittens? Yeah, so it's absolutely hands off, as you said. We stay mm. well out the way and it's, each female, I'd argue, sort of behaves in a very similar way. Um, you don't often see them. If you suspect they've given birth, they won't come out. Mm -hmm. Anything from a period of anything from sort of three to ten days I've had, we just don't see the mother cat at all. Um, and she quite often won't eat as well for a few days because she's very much focusing on protecting their young. Um, so that's, that's pretty standard behaviour. We completely change our keeper routine up there. We stay well away. We only go up there once a day. And then we actually... 
start to put cameras up about four to five weeks into suspected birth date. Um, we don't like to go in and rummage around. It's just not something that we encourage at all. Um, and you're going to probably deal with a horrible consequence of doing that, which is quite often, it wouldn't be unusual if the mother cat destroyed the young if you were to disturb her too much. Wow. Um, so we, we stay well away, even from just throwing the food in from the door. We don't go in. Um, leaving the faeces because they use it as a mark of territory and if you keep removing that every day you can actually make them feel more anxious um, so yeah they, they they require a lot you know a lot of mammals actually and other carnivores is that you do have to be re very respectful of their young and just as we were you want some privacy you want to mm -hmm. know they're secure and safe and there's not something there that's going to potentially make them feel otherwise yeah uh, obviously it's very important that they're offshore but we do have a wildcat here at, um, at Wildwood um, do you want to speak a little bit about her yeah, so we've got uh, one female wildcat on show, she said, and she's a great ambassador animal for, for wildcats and she's really good with our, with our public talks and we can explain what the differences are, for instance, between a wildcat and a, a domestic cat. Um, she's a bit of an unusual one. She was hand-reared by myself and a couple of the other team members um, going on 13 years ago now. Wow. They're not supposed to stay tame, however, she has remained very tame, so... Mm. It's probably because I've always been around. I'd imagine that's probably added to that behaviour to be that way. Um, but yeah, she's very friendly. They shouldn't be friendly. <laughs> she has her moments. Um, there's certainly staff that she doesn't like. And she's <laughs> one of those is the vet, unfortunately, for annual vaccinations. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she's, she's a great species to show people why we're doing what we're doing mm. and how important it is um, in order to save the species. And for those that don't know, wildcats are really on the edge of extinction now mm. and the population that you would find you'd only find them up in the highlands of scotland and they're so sporadic in population um, that actually there's no way that this species can now survive without the intervention of captive breeding help and with having her on show it just enables us to really demonstrate to the public when they come in through our talks um, how important they are that they were they are our only native feeded cat um, they came here about 9,000 years ago and they do really play a completely vital, important role to balance out our ecosystems. Mm. She's, yeah, she's, she's absolutely fantastic, but I do think that um, I am one of the staff members that she doesn't like. Okay. Because <laughs> every time I go over there with the camera, she definitely has that resting, uh, grumpy face. Yes, that, yes. Uh, she's not a fan of the camera. No, absolutely not, <laughs> which is fair enough, which is fair enough. Um, it's not for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I can vouch for it. Exactly, yeah. Maybe there's a bit of a comparison there between you and your animals. Maybe. Yeah, um, yeah one of the things I wanted to um, sort of start talking about as well, uh, one of the favourite um, animals at Wildwood is is our Wildwood wolf pack um, and obviously you, you, you look after those as well. Um, I've only been kind of working for Wildwood for like the last 10 months or so so I don't know the full history of the Wildwood wolf pack. Um, what is it? You know how long have they yeah, been yeah, here good for? Question. Yeah. yeah so they arrived here 20 oh goodness me 2015 they arrived at Wildwood and we just had two at the start so we we've got a pack of five wolves and it's made up of a mum and dad and their three sons um, but initially uh, we just had Odin which is the male wolf and we had Nuna which is our female wolf and they both came from captive settings um, in European zoos and they came over in 2015 as I said <laughs> so I was trying to remember um, and they'd never met before so it was you know, quite an experience for the staff here and I was there for this as well where we actually mix them together I'd never done wow. anything like that before and obviously done a lot of research and going back to what I said earlier it's just so important to be transparent and ask for help and other collections that have these animals and um, really encourage anyone to to ask if you're not sure about something and so we were we were guided by other collections who had done this on how to go about mixing them um, so we did that and the, our female Nina, she certainly became top dog very quickly. Odin was quite submissive and it's been that way ever since. So we're a few years down the line and, and that, that's remained the same. And then in 2018, they had their first litter and they were made up of four pups, four boys. And we were really, really lucky that she actually had boys because it has transpired that having more males in your pack is actually easier to manage than having females. So we were really lucky that she had boys and there must have been something in the water that year because everything had boys. Um, so yeah, um, unfortunately, a few years later, we actually lost one of those and that was 
quite sad and we wondered how the pack would move forward with that because everyone knows wolf packs very tight knit and they all work together um, but again the reality is I think it's very much it's survival instinct first and we've got to survive and they didn't really seem to be too affected by the loss of that that wolf. Um, I guess it happens in the wild so this yeah, is it's, it yeah, it's you know it's a it's a natural thing that does occur unfortunately and um, mm. obviously it's it's our job to make sure that they do respond okay and, and we're monitoring them constantly when anything like that happens to any of our animals. Um, so yeah, so the, the wolf pack have been in this enclosure for uh, quite a few years now and they've had, the enclosure had lots of alterations as the years have gone on and this year we've had a really exciting project where we've actually extended our enclosure out. Oh, amazing. And uh, yeah, it, it, it looks absolutely brilliant up there. Are they it up there really now does. or is that, is it just... It's just coming to the, the final the t final tweaks of the enclosure just happening now. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a much easier way to manage them. Um, we can move them around in a lot safer way for them and mm -hmm. our staff, which is obviously priority first. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's a really lovely enclosure and we've particularly focused on how we move our animals around. So you'll find even, even in your own home, if you have a cat flap or a dog flap, it tends to just be about the same size for the animal to go through. Mm. And we found with our wolves that actually they don't really like going through a slide that's just about the same size as them. Yeah. They are a pack animal. Um, so we've actually come up with these much bigger slides where the animals can actually move forward um, as a few individuals at a time rather than just go right, through okay. one at a time. Um, we found that they, they don't really like being asked to go through that tiny space. Mm. So we're hoping that having these much bigger slide panels, they're going to feel much happier. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm looking, I just can't wait for them to go in. I think it's going to be absolutely yeah, amazing. I mean, every time I've been walking around there, the rangers have done it. I mean, as with all of the work that they've done, they've done an incredible job um, in some pretty bad weather. I mean, we've had oh, terrible yeah. weather. Um, <laughs> um, so I mean, this is we're recording this uh, kind of late April. So by the time that this goes out, it might be ready. I'm hoping so, yeah. I, I don't see why it shouldn't be. Um, but yeah, we're, we're nearly ready to go. It really is the final bits now. Yeah. And, um, this is where I'll put like a bit of text saying it's not yet ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it should be... The area that we've done is slightly off show. And again, we, we did want that because the enclosure at the moment for people that have come to the park and, and know our pack quite well, it is quite exposed. Mm. And, you know, they, they get used to that and they don't seem to mind it. But it's always nice to give that animal a choice to mm. go off a little bit if they want to. And they, they, I should say, they do have an indoor area. Um, so they can always go into that, it's always open to them. Mm. Um, but I think it's also nice to give them an area that isn't indoors and it is open, but maybe just has a little bit more privacy for them. Mm. Um, and this is what this is going to offer. Um, you will still be able to see them from the public path. They are going to be a bit further back. Um, but we've also built in these really great platforms, some lovely high structures. They're not animals that climb. However, in captivity, just a lot of our, a lot of our mammals, um, they do prefer to be up high in a captive setting, probably because they can see out and hear everything mm. that they can see, probably feel safer. Um, so they've got these great platforms and, and I'm 100% confident that they were gonna, they're going to use them. And there's no doubt that you'll be able to see them using those platforms. Nice. And I know that our members sort of appreciate the everything that we do is is trying to give the, the, the species and animals as near to their natural habitat as possible so we always get a lot of people uh, sort of you know commending us on that so I'm sure that this I mean how, how much more space have they got is it quite a big area in there it's I think it's just under half an acre that they've got wow. um, big, as an extra big addition though, yeah so they've got they've got just over an acre at the moment so this is an additional about half an acre um, mm. so it'll be a much bigger space and it's just it's obviously to give them more space you're never going to say no to a bigger enclosure. Um, Absolutely. And the, the main reason we've done it is just to be able to manage them um, safely. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the day they get to go in there. Brilliant. And next to the, the wolves, we've obviously got uh, another incredible species, our, our lynx pair. Um, I understand there's um, some work going on um, that side as well. Yep. So also this year, we're going to be having a new lynx enclosure built. And so again, that is going to be much bigger and much better than we've already got. And um, similar to the wall, so it's going to be the same kind of fencing, the same fence post structure, um, more platforms, more indoor areas, and just a much bigger available area for them to really stretch their, their muscles, make it really complex. Um, we're just in the process at the moment of maybe putting a design together with our maintenance team, and hopefully we'll get to work on that towards the end of the year. Brilliant. So that's going to come a little bit later in, yeah. in, in 2024. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, there seems to be so much 
work going on at Wildwood. I can't, I mean, I help out with the socials and I just can't seem to keep up with you guys. <laughs> Always you know? busy. Exactly, yeah. Um, and there was also um, Pine Martin enclosures that have recently been built. Yes. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, what's, what's the plans kind of uh, around that? Yeah, so we've had eight enclosures built for Pine Martins and we've got one here at the moment and he has just moved into one of those new ones a couple of weeks ago and absolutely loving life in there. <laughs> it's a lovely exhibit and um, whoever comes in to visit, I'd strongly encourage you to go down there and have a look. It's, it's a really lovely enclosure. And they've been built essentially for a project to restore a species um, into South East England. It's a fairly new idea and project at the moment and it's very much in its infancy, but that is a long-term plan. Um, and hopefully we'll try to source a female pine martin at the moment. Um, it's very challenging, however, so it doesn't come without some issues. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll have more here um, mm. to help aid that, that project. But as I said, it's very much in its infancy at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one of the things that I always, um, sort of amazed by is it's kind of the differences because obviously we've got Wildwood Kent uh, where we're at, we're at now and Wildwood Devon um, is the difference in, in species and the difference in um, just personalities across both of the parks I mean the wild Wildwood wolves down in Devon are completely I mean our wolves you know they'll they'll sort of be a bit um, you know cautious and then and then run away whereas the the wildwood wolves in in devon is just so much more open mm. um i mean could you talk a little bit about the differences in 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 kind of both of the parks yes i know the ones down in devon are, have been ham reared so i think in a way that already eradicates maybe a degree of nervousness in those wolves however i would say that when it comes to managing them, whether they're ham reared or not ham reared. Um, I was a parent reared wolves here in Kent. Mm. The behaviour um, in a lot of experiences with them is still very much the same, really whether they're ham reared or not. And um, I think just like a pet dog, you know, they're, they're so, so intelligent and they know who you are. They know who they don't like. Mm. Um, they know who they're more competent to come over to. Um, so they've worked with them since they've arrived and they're, they're fairly, I wouldn't say trusting in me, um, it's important not to get that mixed up, but yeah. they are more likely to probably come over to me, so have a really good um, inspection, and it's obviously through the fence, by the way, we don't go in with them. Um, <laughs> not a good idea. <laughs> no, and I, I, do, I guess it's probably the same in, in Devon, I've been down there and worked with the staff there, they very much recognise their keepers, um, and that's really important to maintain that relationship. Um, so we, off, we go up every single day with um, some tiny bits of food and we bring them over to the fence and we feed them. And it, it's so important that we do that and we have to really look at them closely. They're obviously a species that don't want to come near you most of the time. So it, it took a lot of work, it took months and months and months of training uh, to get them to come over to do that. Um, and I know they also do it down in the Devon Park too. And it's something that we are really proud that we've achieved um, doing that. So. Yeah. So I've been uh, listening to a lot of other different um, rewilding podcasts and one of the things I've been astounded at is the uh, reintroduction of wolves and, and, and also bears, uh, but mainly wolves um, across Europe. Um, have you ever been out there and like into areas where that you know there is actually wolves or is, is that something you'd love to do? So yeah, last October I went to Bavaria, it's actually for a European wildcat conference, um, which was great. Um, but they did touch on what other wildlife they have in that area of Germany and they were saying about wolves and it was nice to think that we were probably not far from where wolves were. Um, I know there's a lot of effort, um, more than there has been across parts of Europe, to reintroduce the wolf back or increase their numbers mm. and certainly start changing the mindsets of how people feel about this predator. Mm. Um, and attitudes I think are slowly changing and so we can't forget what the benefits are of having an apex predator yeah. and um, what, it, what it does for our ecosystems. It's incredibly important. Mm. Do you think we'll ever get to the point of, I know there's people who chat about reintroducing wolves in the UK. Do you, are you confident that that would ever happen? Oh, I don't know. I, I would, if it's I'm a being, huge hurdle. I yeah. mean, we don't even have links. I mean, this is or it. Pie Martin. I mean, it's just, it's just incredible to me that the, the difference in you yeah. know, that there's wild roaming wolves and um, I think yeah. we just have to see the positives and, and how much, you know, I've been in this industry for 10 years and there's always been effort, don't get, don't get me wrong, for a lot of species reintroductions, but in the last 10 years I've been working here and seeing how much conservation efforts have happened across the UK for predators is, it's amazing really. So mm. the pine martin recoveries, um, we're now working on this, this 
several, quite a few now, wildcat projects. And I think mm. it's just those small steps mm. um, and really focusing on a lot of education as well. And mm. you never know, one day we might be reaching something like a lynx, but mm. you know, that's... It's important um, to do those first steps and you just sort of this is it, manage yeah. expectations. And, and also, I guess there's a lot of, you know, I, I know that when any, any sort of conservation project happens, there's just, um, you know, it, there's kind of like four years before anything even starts. and um, yeah, I guess it's baby steps and, uh, and and starting off with those sort of smaller mammals. And, uh, this is it. Yeah, there's lo lots to consider with these things, and um, it's it's got to be done properly, and you have to think of every little step involved, and and make sure the right people are communicated with, and mm. and get it's, the support you need. Yeah, so obviously the headlines: Will wolves ever be back? And I think it just yeah. Yeah, I I, I think <coughs> I don't know about that one, um, but maybe links one day in our lifetime that would, be, that uh, could be possible. And um, we'll just have to see how we go. Brilliant. Well, I know that you are incredibly busy, um, so I won't um, take up any more of your time, but we do have uh, a little tradition uh, where we get a couple of people, uh, like our members, to DM in a couple of questions. Okay. Um, so we have a little bowl that I bring out. Uh, and again, we're very thrilled to announce it's again sponsored. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, we're thrilled to announce today's episode is again sponsored by Veloso Tours. Veloso Tours is one of the UK's leading specialist tour operators to Latin America, India, Indonesia and China. Veloso Tours share our commitment to ethical practices and animal welfare in all of the destinations they specialise in. With over 25 years experience, they offer unique, personalised and authentic tailor-made holidays for couples, solo travellers, small groups and multi-generational families. Their ethos is to provide an authentic, in-depth experience of the local life, history, incredible wildlife and culture of the destination that they take you to. <laughs> With expert local guides to join you on your adventure. And good news, Wild One members receive a 5% discount when booking. Simply quote your membership number when speaking to Veloso team and they'll get you sorted. So yeah, thank you again to Veloso Tours. Um, could you choose a question please? And I will I read it out for you. I can. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. Let's see what they've come up with for you. Interesting. Which animal at the Trust do you think has the most personality? Oh. You have to choose one. I know, it's really hard to choose one. <laughs> They've all got big personalities. Um, oh, I'd probably say the wolves, actually. Yep. I just think that you just don't know what you're going to get every day. They're so unpredictable. Um, they can go from this really happy, bouncy animal that comes running over to you in a positive way um, mm. to one you can just complete opposite in the same day. It's some very nervous, skittish animal as well. So I don't know. It's hard, really, to pick one. Um, I love going in and seeing Isla the wildcat mm. personality there. She's oh, just, just going to go start mentioning so all positive. of them now. The time, I can't, I can't <laughs> yeah, pick you're like, one. Yeah, you're like an animal mum, you're like, one. okay, they're all equally perfect. I can't pick one. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. All right. It's a good question, though. Yeah. So we'll say, we'll say wolves for now, but they're all. Yeah. But if any of the animals ask, you would love them all equally. I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. If we could pick the second question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Imagine animals are running wildward for a day. What do you think the first rule would be that they'd introduce? <laughs> you hate these questions, don't you? I don't know. Can you give me an easy one? <laughs> <laughs> I can't really give them. Uh, okay. You pick a second question for me, yeah. please. We definitely haven't uh, read through three or four questions. <laughs> How do the seasons affect the behaviour of the animals in your care? Um, quite a lot, actually. Um, so if we take things like the Arctic foxes, um, you might notice in the summertime they have quite a jet black coat and in the winter they have this really fluffy white coat. Um, so they will alter with the seasons and it also affects their appetite as well. So they need to eat a lot of food towards the end of summer and early autumn mm. in order for this white coat to start. Um, so that's just one example of how much they're affected by the seasons. They definitely alter their, their coats. And actually, same with the wolves as well. They'll, they'll have a winter coat and a summer coat. Um, and then a lot of our animals are breeding. And again, in the springtime, that behaviour really does start to change. So we have animals calling, animals nest building. Um, so that's a, that's a massive change during the seasons as well. Brilliant. Okay, and the final question? Oh, there's another one. One more, yeah. There's three in total. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> what are some of the unexpected skills you need in your job as a wildlife keeper? 
I think there's, there are actually a whole host of skills that you do need, which I think aren't very obvious. Um, you know, a lot of the time you're dealing with some quite tough situations or you can come into work and have a planned day ahead and there could be quite a reactive situation that you've got to deal with and you have to be very calm, you have to be very clear and concise in what you're going to do to resolve this problem. And it could be anything from an animal suddenly being very sick and you have now got to reorganise your day and your team effectively um, to make sure the animals that are here are, are dealt with and, and cleaned and watered and everything else um, but also that the priority that this animal who's not well needs to be taken care of and a lot of the time that can lead to higher stress levels, high emotions and it's just having to to deal with that effectively and make sure your team's okay and, and the welfare of the, your team's okay um, but also just being sensible in those decisions on how you're going to resolve this problem and I think yeah just just knowing how to be quite resilient and working under quite high emotions sometimes and, and pressure um, when you're dealing with some quite tough situations. Mm. That's a really good answer. Well Sally thank you very much I know you're a little bit nervous about doing the podcast <laughs> and I think you've done incredible um, yeah I'm sure we'll see you on future podcasts so yeah thank you for your time. Thank you.